Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's MAP webinar on uh, sources of predictability at sub-seasonal to seasonal timescales. My name is Heather Archambault. Um, I'm a program manager in MAP, the Modeling Analysis Predictions and Projections Program. So today's webinar is jointly sponsored by the National Weather Service Office of Science and Technology Integration and GTGBS program, so that's the Next Generation Global Prediction System. And uh, Tim Schneider is joining us virtually from Boulder to serve as a co-host today. And uh, before I give a brief introduction on today's topic, I want to first let you know that this webinar is being recorded, and uh, we'll be posting it on our MAP webinar webpage, along with PDFs of each presentation. Uh, all phones will be muted during the presentation, but if you'd like to ask a question at any point, you can let me know by sending me a chat message uh, in, in WebEx, and yeah, you can access the chat box by hovering over the tab that you'll see at the top of the screen, um, the blue tab uh, in the WebEx event center, and uh, if you click on that, then you can uh, access the chat button from, uh, chat function from there, and you can either write out your question for me to read, or you can uh, let me know uh, that you just have a question and then I can unmute your line. And we should have plenty of time for questions and answers after each of the three presentations today, and, and we may have some time for a general discussion at the end of all three presentations on the topic of, of sub-seasonal to seasonal predictability. Um, so uh, on that topic, uh, as many of you undoubtedly know, this is an emerging high-priority research area that's being spearheaded by the WWRP and WCRP through the International uh, S2S Prediction Project, which our first speaker will discuss. Uh, on the national level, uh, exploring sources of predictability that can underpin uh, the prediction of extremes at time scales beyond the traditional numerical weather prediction time scale, so into weeks three to four out to a season, is, is a high priority. Uh, stakeholders in sectors such as emergency management, energy, and water resource management have a, have a need for skill prediction, uh, skillful predictions at this time scale. And uh, in September 2015, the Climate Prediction Center started issuing experimental uh, week three, four or precipitation and temperature outlooks and uh, just recently um, has operationalized the temperature outlook for week three and four. Um, so, uh, however, though, there's, there's a major research issue in that it's not necessarily, necessarily clear how to harvest predictability from the different sources of variability that exist at this time scale. So uh, examples of the variability, um, there are many sources of potential predictability, atmospheric blocking, soil moisture anomalies, the Madden Julian, Julian Oscillation, and the North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, but uh, we believe that's key to ultimately producing skillful predictions at this time scale. So within NOAA, there are several emergent research and transition activities spinning up in this area of sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction. Uh, at both the National Weather Service and within OAR, at the labs, uh, the Office of Weather and Air Quality, and also, of course, at CPO, uh, not just in the MAP program, but also in the Climate Variability and Predictability program. So today, uh, we'll learn more about the work of the international project, the S2S Prediction Project, and also highlight two of the NOAA efforts, and that's the MAP Subseasonal to Seasonal Prediction Task Force, and also the National Weather Service NGGBS Week 3 Weeks three, uh, four program, and the latter, uh, which Tim Schneider will discuss in a little bit. So I just want to say, uh, just say a few words about the the map, uh, subseasonal to seasonal prediction task force. So this is a new PI-driven group of more than 40 scientists that are coordinating and collaborating on projects related to the modeling and prediction of various sources of predictability at the subseasonal to seasonal timescales. And the members of the task force include PI's uh, leading SUBEX, which is an international or interagency, sorry, um, R2O subseasonal to seasonal experimental prediction system project uh, that's, that's jointly sponsored through the, the NOAA climate test bed <coughs> with NSEP. So the, the work conducted uh, jointly supported by um, the National Weather Service. Uh, um, as well as uh, other federal partners, uh, the Office of the Naval of uh, uh, ONR, sorry, Office of Naval Research, and the NASA MAP program. That's MAP with one P. And uh, so this involves collaboration with the with Environment Canada and uh, the Weather Service uh, NSEP. So the task force also contributes. I'll switch back to that. Uh, this is a group that contributes to the International S2S Prediction Project, and you'll hear more about that from our next speaker, Frederick Retard. And as he is uh, bringing up his slides, I will 
um, sip control to him and uh, give an introduction. So uh, Frederick joined ECMWF in 1998 after completing a PhD at Princeton University on seasonal prediction of tropical cyclones. He's currently principal scientist in the predictability section in the research department at ECMWF. His main expertise is on subseasonal predictability with a focus on the prediction of the Madden Julian oscillation and its teleconnections. His primary responsibility at ECMWF is the development, upgrade, and validation of extended range forecasts, and he is also the co-chair of the WWRP, WCRP, S2S prediction project that I mentioned and that he will talk more about. Uh, so, Frederick, whenever you're ready, uh, you can take it away. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank can you hear me waiting? Waiting? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I will give a presentation on the MGO prediction on the connections in the subseasonal forecast. Uh, this presentation will have three main parts. The first part will be about the WWRP, WCRP S2S project database, which was mentioned just now. Uh, the second part uh, will be about the prediction of the MGO and sort of intercomparison of MGO prediction in uh, the database of the S2S project. And the third part will be about the, uh, the ability of those models to, uh, to represent the MGO teleconnections in the extratropic. So what I am talking about teleconnections is mostly the link between the MGO and the NAO, so the most uh, tropical and tropical uh, interaction. So briefly about uh, the, this first slide shows the schematic of the WRP, WCRP, Subsidial to Civil Position Project, which is a five-year project which started in November 2013. So it's uh, co-chaired by uh, Andrew Robertson from IRI and myself. And it's organized around the six main topics uh, teleconnections, uh, modern United Association, monsoons, Africa, extremes, and verification on products. And then we have a series of uh, cross-cutting activities or questions which are common to most of those sub-projects, like uh, initialization, which, what is the optimal way to initialize subsequent forecast for both ocean and atmosphere, and stable generation, what is uh, the best configuration? Should we go for burst or lag ensembles? Resolution, impact of resolution for the atmosphere ocean, ocean and coupling, role of systematic errors, multimodal combination, and so on. We have also an, uh, needs, we have also collaboration with the WMO CIRA group, uh, for, which is a working group on societal and economic research applications uh, to demonstrate the, the usefulness of the signal to signal forecast for, uh, several, for a large range of applications. So an important contribution to this uh, WRP, WCRP, S2S project uh, is a MAP task force, which was just mentioned by Sir, which includes the uh, primary resource scientists funded through the recent uh, MAP program competition. So reinforced by, uh, by the S2S task force, uh, those span a wide range of topics, as shown in this uh, graphic. Uh, and they include uh, atmospheric phenomena and processes, uh, like the MGO, uh, ENSO, stratosphere polar vortex, blocking and EO, uh, ocean atmosphere inter and land atmosphere interaction, uh, organization and testing of dynamical subsidial prediction systems, look at the impact of model resolution, model physics, model forecast setup, multimodal strategy, and uh, so exploring alternative ways to advance prediction using post-processing techniques. So look at the skill of the model, predictability, verification products. And uh, as already mentioned, uh, this uh, this project, this, um, this MAP task force, uh, will rely on uh, several uh, data sets, uh, the NBB, the SUBEX, which was just uh, described before, and also the S2S database. So the S2S database, which I will describe now, uh, consists, um, is, uh, includes uh, real-time forecast and re-forecast from 11 operational centers. Uh, across the world, so we have NCEP with contribution to CFS2, uh, Environment Canada, we have subsidial you know, forecasts from UK Met Office, CCMWF, Meteo France, ISAC in Italy, HMCI in Russia, CMA, KMA, GMA, and Bureau Meteorology. And uh, we have uh, two archiving centers, CCMWF and uh, CMA, and the address of the data portal. So this database is already uh, operational. It's uh, available to the research community from those uh, two uh, uh, data portals. And uh, 
This next slide uh, shows the configuration of those 11 models. Um, so we archive data up to day 60, although some of those models go beyond uh, day 60. There are some of them also part of the signal forecasting systems. Uh, the archiving stops at day 60, so we have a time range from 32 to 60 days. The resolution is quite variable. Some models have uh, low resolution, like BOM at 250 kilometers. Uh, on this, so we range from 250 kilometers to uh, 30 kilometers for the finest resolution with this MWF. Uh, the frequency, there is two groups of uh, models. Some are running on the daily uh, basis, like uh, NCEP. Uh, some others are running on a weekly basis, uh, once or twice a week. And they, are, they usually have a much larger NCEP size, so it's most, uh, uh, the forecasts are produced most in burst mode. The reforecasts are also quite variable. Uh, some uh, are called what we call fixed. That's the models which have uh, which keeps the same versions for quite a number of years. For example, NSET, the CFS2. Uh, so, so for those models, the reforecasts have been produced once for all. Uh, for other models, like SMUF or UTMS office, uh, the model can change once or several times a year. So we need to keep the reforecast to produce reforecasts all the time, and those reforecasts are produced in parallel to the return forecast, so we call them on the fly. The period uh, covered is, uh, once again, varies. Uh, there is a common period, which is 1999-2010. And uh, once again, reforecast side on frequency can be, can be quite different, sometimes daily, weekly, or monthly basis. So, I mean, unlike SEBEX, uh, which, is, uh, which has a protocol, uh, here this database is more a database of opportunity. We cannot really impose operational centers in certain protocols, so we are more collecting all the real-time and reforecast produced by all, uh, the, all those centers. So there are a lot of differences, but there are enough commonalities to look at multi-model ensemble from real-time forecast uh, from next month onwards. For instance, all those models uh, produce uh, will have a forecast available on Thursday. Uh, for the re-forecast, there are enough commonalities to be able to do intercomparison and to, uh, to assess the skill of those models. So as I will show for the case of the MGO. So I will start now the second part of this talk, so about the assessment of the MGO in the S2S database. And uh, so since I'm not sure everyone here is familiar with the uh, MGO index, I will go briefly through the Wheeler and other MGO index, which has been applied to all the reforecasts. Uh, it consists, uh, this uh, index uh, consists here of projecting the, the real the forecast onto uh, pre-computed combined EOS of OLR, U2, UA50, U200. So the two uh, dominant EO combined EOFs uh, in the tropics, of those uh, three, three variables, um, are displayed on the left side of this panel. So combined EOF1 is characterized by negative OLR, so OLR is a solid line, so negative OLR over the maritime continent, which means the enhanced convection over the maritime continent. Combined EOF2 has a more dipole structure with a suppressed convection over the Indian Ocean and the enhanced convection over the maritime continent. And those two combined UF can represent very well the uh, propagation of the MGO. So if we go to the schematic of the original paper by Madan and Julian in 1972, uh, the MGO can be characterized by uh, convection in the Indian Ocean, which corresponds to negative wave 2, which is moving eastward to the maritime continent, positive wave 1, to the West Pacific, positive wave 2, and then into the Western Hemisphere, negative wave 1. So in this context, we can represent an MGO like in the phase space of those two pieces. So the ocean is O2 negative wave 2, maritime continent positive wave 1, the Western Pacific positive wave 2, and Western Hemisphere negative wave 1. And that MGO can be represented as a circle, as the, the, the blue line shows, for an example, in 1987. So the distance from the center of this circle represents the amplitude of the MGO. Um, so it's a quite a nice way so to, to display the MGO. We know from, from this uh, graphic exactly where is the MGO at a given time and what is its intensity. And it's also very valuable to assess the scale of the model uh, because then we can uh, compute the bivariate correlation between the time varying time variation uh, of the ensemble mean, in this case, and uh, on the verification. So when we perform that on the S2S models, uh, the graphic here shows uh, the bivariate correlation from, um, so it shows uh, at which lead time in days uh, the bivariate correlation falls to 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 correlation. 
So the yellow is 0 0.5 correlation, so it shows that uh, for those uh, 10 models, I'll show you only 10 models, so 11 one which is KMA doesn't provide OLI yet, so we didn't include it. And uh, so for those 10 models, uh, we reach a correlation of 0.5, which we can take as a limit of predictive skill uh, between uh, 11 and 34 days. On average, I would say most models uh, reach a correlation of 0.5 around day, around, uh, day 20 or around three weeks, which is a big achievement. I mean, a few a decade ago, uh, most models uh, had still up to about uh, two weeks. So there's been really a very large improvement in the subsequent forecasting system to, to predict uh, the MGO. So, of course, uh, this, so this shows uh, the correlation, the correlation between the ensemble mean and uh, error interim. Those results may be dependent on the verification uh, chosen uh, on my favor is MDUA, for instance, which is initialized. The reforecasts are initialized from error interim. I forget to mention that the reforecast here covers the common period 1999-2010 for all the models to have a fair comparison. So the next slide shows um, the sensitivity of the MGO skill scores to the choice of their analysis. So here we have done, uh, we have also verified uh, three of the models, SOS models, SMWF, Biometeorology, and uh, CFS2, uh, against three different uh, reanalysis data sets, so here interim, uh, 20th century reanalysis version 2, and the Japanese GRJI 55. So for green is this MWF, we can see that uh, the skill score, so this shows the evolution of the big value correlation as a function of the lead time from day 1 to day 32. And for SMWF, there is not much difference uh, between the score we get with the interim and GRJI 55. And there is quite a significant degradation, however, when we verify against the 20th century reanalysis. The two other models are also quite sensitive to the choice of the analysis for verification, a bit less than the SMWF model. So, in conclusion, there is some sensitivity to the reanalysis, but uh, this sensitivity seems to be much smaller than the difference between the various models. So, this suggests that the hierarchy of model we can see here is unlikely to change when verifying against uh, other uh, reanalysis. So it seems to be, it should not be too sensitive to the choice of the verification reanalysis. Now, this uh, plot shows the skill of the model to predict you know, the phase of the MGO in uh, up to day 30. Uh, however, it doesn't give much indication of how well do the model to predict the amplitude of, uh, of the model. So, so this plot here, uh, shows the uh, evolution of the uh, amplitude error of the model relative to error interim. On the right shows the uh, phase error relative to error interim from those 10 models. So if we go to the left panel, uh, negative uh, vertical axis shows uh, amplitude error relative to error interim. So a negative number means that the amplitude is, that the is too weak. A positive number means it's too strong, and the number is a fraction. So minus 0.2 means, for example, it's 20% too weak. So what we can see is that uh, most of the S2S models tends to very quickly uh, have an MGO which is uh, to develop an MGO which is too weak, and that uh, seems to last for most of the 31st two days of the forecast. An exception may be CNAM, which tends to have an MGO increasing in intensity with the lead time. On average, uh, the MGO tends to be about between 15 and 20% too weak in um, the majority of uh, models. Uh, for the phase error, it's the same thing. For the positive number indicates an MGO which is uh, too fast. Uh, negative number means an MGO which is too quick, too, too, too slow, sorry. And uh, so what we can see is that most of models in the medium range tends to have an MGO propagating too fast, and then slowly the MGO gets to, they tend to slow down as the lead time increase. And by day 32, by the by week three, week four, uh, most of the models tend to have an MGO which is too slow, uh, which is quite consistent with the result we see with the signal forecast, where the MGO tends to be a bit uh, stationary. So although those models are very different, they seem to share quite very similar characteristics in terms of systematic errors. Another issue which has been um, also mentioned in, uh, recently in the literature is the issue of uh, propagating the MGO across the maritime continent. Uh, in observations, it happens uh, from time to time that an MGO which starts in the Indian Ocean 
uh, doesn't propagate uh, into the, the West Pacific. Uh, but it seems to happen more often in some models. There have been uh, some, uh, so some study on the ECM, ECMWF model or CFS model, version 2 models, uh, showing that those two models tend to have too many NGO dying while crossing the maritime continent. So this graphic here shows a proportion of NGO which start in the blue area in the initial conditions, which never make it to the orange area, which is the West Pacific. So in the interim, it's about 10% of the cases. Uh, for the models, it's uh, between 20 and 40, 50 percent of the case. So it seems that uh, all the models tend uh, to have a, to a larger proportion of NGO uh, dying while crossing the maritime continent. And uh, this is uh, quite an important topic, uh, which is one of the, the main topics of the S2S, uh, the international S2S project and the NGO, and the one of the topics in, uh, in the map uh, S2S task force. Okay, so the so, so slides so far uh, have shown that the model has some skill to predict the, the MGO up to week three, week four, uh, and this, uh, which is quite a good news for the predictive skill uh, in the extratropics, uh, and that's probably the, the first uh, step uh, for, for, um, for, for, for to have good predictive skill in the extratropics is to have a good prediction of the MGO. The second step is uh, to, to, have, uh, to, to have the capability of the MGO to, to talk to the MGO to, uh, to um, interact with the extratropics. So this paper by Kasu has, has been quite a literature on this topic, uh, showing that uh, when you have an MGO at the face of the MGO in the Indian Ocean or uh, over the West Pacific, and they tend to, uh, to trigger a Rosby waves, which propagate in the extratropics and, um, and uh, affect uh, the NAO uh, to, to sweeten that later. And this is here an example from uh, CASU, which is a paper in Nature in 2008, uh, which shows for the impact of the NGO on the core weather regime from reanalysis, negative, positive NAO, Atlantic Ridge, and Scandinavian blocking, and that's the eighth phase of the NGO, and it shows, the bar here shows um, the, the, the variability of uh, frequency of those weather regimes following an MGO in phase one to eight, from day one, from the time from day one to day 15. So one conclusion uh, from, this, uh, from this graphic is that the MGO affects mostly the NEO, NEO plus NEO minus, more than the Atlantic Ridge, not the blocking, and it's mostly after an MGO at the phase of the MGO over the Indian Ocean and West Pacific that we get a response. So uh, about two to three, ten, to, about 10 days after an MGO in the uh, Indian Ocean, we tend to get positive NEO, on 10 days after an MGO, uh, negative as of the MGO for the Indian Ocean, we tend to get negative NEO. So the question is, can the model reproduce uh, this impact? Uh, to do that, uh, we produce a composite. Uh, we look at here a composite of Z500 anomalies. Uh, the third delta, so between day 10 and 14, after an MGO is in phase three for the extended winter, November to March. So the top left panel represents the Z500 anomalies from air interim. It shows this, so North America is in the, the left, Europe is here, and we get, so this is a strong positive NEO signal, and uh, this is what we get from the 10 uh, S2S models. So what we can, so there are several, con several uh, conclusions here. One is that most of the models represent relatively well, the, seem to represent relatively well these patterns of the three connections. Most of them have something that looks like a positive NEO. Uh, some, a lot of models tend to overestimate the tail connections uh, in the North Pacific and underestimate them in the Euro-Atlantic sector. So the, none of them show uh, a signal over the Euro-Atlantic, which is as strong as the one we get in the interim. So if we try to measure this, we use, um, we project those patterns on uh, predefined uh, NEO patterns, EOF, com competed from EOF. Uh, so this index has a mean of zero and standardization of one. For air interim, then we get an index of 0 0.48. And we can see that for the model, none of them uh, gets close to, to, to this number. Um, another point I want to make here is that all the models here have been ordered as a function of their horizontal resolution. From the low resolution one, bureau meteorology, to the high resolution one, it's MWF. And there seems, although it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, that the model with the lowest resolution tends to have very weak tail connections. The ones with the highest resolution tend to have much stronger tail connections. So this suggests 
uh, that uh, resolution may be may matter at least for the teleconnections. Okay, so the system may not be fair because here we, for the case of system we have, we put we, we this this the teleconnection has been computed over the over eleven ensemble members. So they have been computed over a much larger sample than the interim, eleven times larger. So which may smooth the signal and uh, so in order to to see uh, if uh, there is what is the variability between ensemble members and if uh, a single ensemble member can reach the interim, uh, we reproduce the same uh, the same plots for each individual ensemble member and uh, compute the NAO index for each of them. So this uh, slide to summarize uh, the um, shows the NAO index. Uh, so three pentas after NGO in phase three, that's in green, and three pentas after an NGO in phase seven, in orange. Uh, the solid circles represent uh, the, uh, the index for when we put all the ensemble members together, and the solid diamonds uh, when for the, the same, for, but for phase seven. And each open circle represents one ensemble member. So some, and some models have a larger ensemble size than others. That's why the number of circles is not the same. Uh, but uh, what we can see is that, first of all, all models uh, show a circle above the diamonds, which means that most all of them uh, suggest that after an MGO in phase three, we have more chance to get a positive NEO than a three pentas after an MGO in phase seven. Um, second conclusion that some models have more difficulty to, dis to, to, to reproduce those stationations, like CMA or uh, CNRM, where the unstable distribution are not really well separated between phase three and phase seven. Whereas uh, CFS2 and the uh, SMWF have much better separation and much better distinction between uh, the NU index we can have an MGO in phase three or phase seven. Another conclusion is that the spread between the can be quite large for some models, which suggests that to really assess the, the representation, representation of the those state connections, we really need a really large uh, sample size. Um, uh, what we can see is the lines here, the green line and the orange line represent the values for Mira Interim, which is plus 0 0.5 about, um, and about um, minus 0 0.45 for NEO7. And we can see that not a single ensemble member really reached this level. So the Mira Interim is really an outsider uh, of the ensemble member uh, for phase three. So for phase seven, two models, the GMA and the government Canada, uh, can show can show uh, some very strong uh, an amplitude of those state connections as large as with the era in theory. Uh, it's quite interesting to notice that those two models, GMA and Environment Canada, are one of the two models, two few models, which are uh, uncoupled in the S2 database. Um, and I will come back to that uh, later. Uh, this plot shows the evolution of those uh, teleconnections uh, patterns uh, as, a, as a function of the lead time with the same wave model. So that's for top is for phase three, for phase seven, the interim. And we can see as the lead time increases, the teleconnection becomes weaker relatively quickly. Uh, by, by one month, it's already a fraction of what it was in the, day, uh, in, in the medium range. Uh, for phase seven, we can see an, uh, an increase actually of the, the model of the error, situation error in the West Pacific, with the spurious negative anomalies and the reduction in the Euro-Atlantic sectors as the time increase. So the next uh, question is uh, what can cause? Uh, so the main conclusion so far is that all the S2S models seem to underestimate the amplitude of the MGO teleconnections in the, over the Euro-Atlantic sector. And uh, the obvious question next is uh, what can cause it? Is it uh, because of the representation of the NGO itself, or the tropical circulation? Or is it because of uh, systematic errors in the extratropics? If the model don't get the jet stream right, or the, tropical, the storm track right, this may, of course, affect the key connections. So here uh, I did an experiment where I run the ETNBF model for cycle 43 r one the current cycle. Uh, couple as a normal mode, and, uh, and then I did the same experiment but with relaxing the tropical bound, 20 north, 20 south, to have the in so to have a sort of a perfect uh, MGO on tropical circulation. And this plot suggests that uh, in terms of the connections, so here we are looking at those three pentas after MGO in phase three, uh, we have a quite an improvement when we relax the tropics. It's much closer to the in the west, north, Pacific is almost perfect. 
your Atlantic sector or whether it's still strongly underestimated. It's better, but uh, still uh, underestimated. We suggest that part of the problems come from the tropic itself, uh, but uh, that uh, errors in the extratropics may also play a role. So that will be uh, one of my last slides. Uh, it's a current investigation is to look at the possibility of uh, the impact of STT bites. So the top left panel uh, shows um, STT bites in the ECMWF supplemental forecast uh, for week four. So, so we can see that um, we tend to have a warm anomaly in the uh, lot of warm anomaly in the tropical bound, mostly over the Indian Ocean. And in the extratropics, we tend to have uh, too cold uh, SST anomalies. This is a February, a first February uh, climate, uh, a bias for first of February. And we see in the North Atlantic, uh, we have uh, quite a relatively high, uh, strong bias. I mean, this is a, a typical problem of couple models with uh, representation of the Gulf Stream, uh, with the separation tends to be much too much to the north. And um, it is claimed that we need a of a degree uh, ocean model to be able to, to, get it, uh, to get it better, to reduce those errors. Uh, currently, we run the model, ocean model with a quarter of a degree ocean. And um, there, has been, there has been a recent papers by Tim Rollins, for instance, who have used that uh, errors in this area and the cluster representation can really affect the position of the storm track and those should uh, affect uh, the FGOP connections. So most of the studies on, uh, have been made mostly in emit mode. There has been no result yet on subsidial forecast. So in order to assess uh, the impact of those biases in uh, the subsidial forecast, I run an experiment where I do a very simple crude bias correction uh, experiment. So the ocean sees the atmosphere as it is. But the uh, atmosphere sees the SST uh, from the ocean plus a small correction. Uh, which is a function of the location, and it's a function also on the start date, on the lead time. And uh, this is a bias we get in this new experiment, so we fix most of the biases in the high latitudes. Uh, they still, uh, we degrade a bit in the west, uh, in the east Pacific, and a slight improvement in the Indian Ocean, but still get some biases, one biases there. And uh, then the white panel shows the impact on the tail connections in those two experiments, set of experiments. So it's the same graphic as I showed before. So the lines represent the value for mirror interim. Each circle represents the value for one ensemble member. The green is those three pentata time in phase three, orange three pentata time in phase seven. And so for control, we can see that uh, once again, uh, the, the tail connections are much weaker in the model than in uh, era interim. Uh, with this uh, bias-directed experiment, we tend to get actually uh, for negative NAO, sweet and time phase seven, there is not much impact, slightly better, but not really statically significant. Uh, but uh, sweep and time joe phase three, we tend to get a much stronger uh, take connections uh, statically significantly. Um, and uh, and when we look at the skill scores, uh, forecast six score for week three, week four, they are significantly improved, particularly over the Europe and the Asia uh, sectors. So suggesting that uh, those bias in SST may be, uh, may be uh, quite an, an important issue uh, for the for uh, and play a role in those uh, MGO extratropic connections. And therefore, it may, it's maybe not a coincidence if the rest of models which are uncoupled uh, may may display a better connections, stronger connections at least than the other models. So I will stop here. I'll just uh, leave the conclusions. That the S2S model shows some, some, show some skills to predict the evolution of the MGO to five weeks in advance. Uh, the MGO tends to get too slow, too weak in the standard range forecast. Uh, the S2S models tend to be able to represent uh, generally well the general pattern of the MGO take connections in the extratropics. But the amplitude is, uh, to your Atlantic sector is too weak, which is really a big problem for, to, to, to really be able to extract the skill from the tropics. So the realism of the equation decreases with the time, and the uh, atmospheric resolution, ocean atmosphere coupling, may, be, uh, may impact actually uh, the amplitude of those state connections. So I will stop here. Thank you. Frederick, thanks so much. Excellent talk. Uh, so I want to remind everyone that you can let me know you have a question. But you can um, send me a message in the chat function, or you can try the raise hand feature. Uh, so while questions are coming in, um, are there any questions from anyone in the room? So um, 
I'll ask a question. Uh, Frederick, so you, you mentioned the potential impact of resolution on the teleconnections between the MJO and the NAO. Um, what are you, how do you plan to explore that more, or, or is there a plan to do experiments to um, look at that issue more? Uh, yes, I mean, there is an experiment ongoing uh, currently, collaboration between ECMWF and CAR uh, on the COLA, a project called METIS, where the ECMWF model is run at uh, different, uh, three different resolutions. So we plan uh, so to, to probably look at the connection in these uh, three different uh, resolutions to see how it affects. Um, and, uh, yes, so that's, that's I think one, one of the main, uh, main avenues for, for, for investigating this issue. And do you have, what's your, do you have underlying hypotheses for that? I mean, are there, what do you think the key processes well, are? Well, the underlying need? hypothesis is that the resolution can be important to get the, uh, the jet stream, the representation of the jet stream, uh, more uh, more realistic representation of the jet stream. I mean, it may, uh, we know that there's been already some, uh, some results uh, with the previous uh, project, like the project Athena, that the frequency of blogging, for instance, uh, is uh, much more realistic at a uh, higher resolution than uh, one degree resolution, for instance. There was a result from a project Athena at that point. So, so there has been already some studies showing that uh, the resolution is important for the representation of uh, weather regimes in the extratropics. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, that should therefore uh, matter for the, for the representation of for the impact of the NGO in the extratropics. Right, great, thanks. Um, Charlotte Demott uh, has a question that I see. Uh, Charlotte, I unmuted you, so you should be able to go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thanks, Heather. Um, so, Frederick, very nice talk. Um, I have a question on the SST anomalies that, I, that you showed and I think the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, within the Indian Ocean, those warm SST biases uh, sort of crudely resemble um, an MGO type gill response. And I'm wondering, um, do you have any insights as to uh, how these develop? My first uh, thought is that perhaps the wind anomalies, the low-level wind anomalies associated with your MGO signal may be too weak, and so possibly uh, the surface fluxes coming off the ocean that would cool the SST are also too weak. And I'm just wondering if you have, uh, can you comment on what you think are the possible sources for that anomaly? Yes, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a possibility. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, we know that the, the winds, uh, the winds are, are generally here too weak. So I mean, is it uh, is it more prominent during an MGO? Is it a more general problem? I don't. Uh, we don't have the. I don't have the answer yet. But uh, I think that's an interesting question. Thank you. What Great, we notice is that a lot of S2S models have a very similar biases, actually, when we compare them in, the, in the, these regions. So, so, so it seems to be a, a general problem with the most models. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question from Ivanka Steiner. Um, Ivanka, I unmuted you if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, well, I can read it. So it's, uh, so Ivanka's question is, the Met Office model seems to have the lowest fraction of MGOs not crossing the maritime continent. Is there any understanding why the Met Office model is the best in that respect? Well, what we, there has been a few studies on the, this problem of crossing the maritime continent. And one of the main hypotheses of why models have problems uh, is linked to the systematic biases, mostly in the precipitation biases in the West Pacific. Uh, in the models like it's MWF, uh, we get tend to get uh, too much precipitation in the West Pacific. Uh, and this uh, really uh, impacts with the way the NGO propagates. So the Met Office has a particularity, a particularity to have very different biases in these regions. Uh, there was actually uh, a study by the Whitney Group uh, 
to try to compare the CBOS model and UK metrophils, which have exactly, almost exactly opposite uh, biases in these regions. So my feeling is that it's due to the, to, to the uh, patterns of precipitation biases in those two models. Great, thank you. Um, we have one more question. Rang Fu, Rang, I unmuted you. You can go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Well, first, uh, do you think the uh, model bias uh, related to MGO teleconnection pattern is more due to errors in circulation or um, errors in convective uh, scheme? Well, the, the plot, the slide I show here, uh, show the impact of uh, basically the, 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 the error we have in the tropics, so in the, convex, the convection in the tropics. Um, and uh, as you can see, it shows that part of the error definitely comes from the tropics. We get better connections when we relax the tropics than in the control, uh, but not uh, all of it. So I would say it's uh, both. Part of it comes from the uh, Come for the tropics. Is it due to the convection or the biases there? It's, it's not clear yet. Uh, but the other part is due to the to systematic biases in the, the circulation in the extra tropics. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, so, okay, one more quick question from Stan Benjamin. Go ahead, Stan. Thank you. Can you hear me there, Heather? Yes, I can. Yes. Go ahead. Great. Okay, so the question, uh, Friedrich, uh, for you is. Uh, uh, following up Charlotte's question, is there ongoing work on, you know, the uh, uh, sensitivity to momentum transport in the cumulus uh, parameterization in the EC model? It seems like that would be a uh, uh, possible impact in the MJO representation. Uh, Estrell's been doing some work in this area. Are you also doing uh, such work and able to do such experiments in that area? Vertical transport of momentum. Or vertical transport. Um, not too many. I mean, we did we did some uh, some experiments some years ago on the momentum transport impact of the presentation, the, the parameterization of momentum transport, but uh, which showed very strong sensitivity in, in our model. I mean, that's where we had a breakthrough in our, in our presentation of the MGO in our model in 2008 uh, with a new, a new new model. But since we haven't done much more. Uh, systematic work in, in, in that regard. Um, okay, thank you. But it's worth investigating, yes. yes. Hey, thanks, Stan. Thanks, Frederick. Thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, great discussion there. Um, so thank you again for your excellent talk. And uh, I will now uh, turn control over to Tim. So Tim, um, you should be able to, you're unmuted now, and I'm passing control to you. Are you there? Yep. Great. Okay, so Tim is going to uh, introduce the next speaker and say a few words about the Week 3 4 program. Yeah, can you yeah. see my screen, honey? Yep, I see your, the Cisco screen. So, yeah, I see you moving around on that. So, just bring up your PowerPoint, which is right behind it. I see it. You got it? You got it? Uh, I see it behind there. It looks like you're, okay, now it's back in the, yeah, get out of the, just minimize the um, WebEx. Don't close it, but just, you know, put that behind. Because, like, yeah, you don't need to be in WebEx. Just go right to your. Um, How's that? Uh, wait, did I actually transfer? Oh, sorry. You know what? I didn't. I'm looking, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't quite transfer. It was asking me if it was okay to transfer, and I was watching Frederick move his stuff around. So, sorry, Tim. <laughs> no worries. Right, Here, we got it, it's working now. Yep. So, okay. go ahead. So, I just have a few remarks, uh, sort of programmatically, what we're doing in the weather service. Uh, and partly, I put a slide or two together just uh, so you have some URLs. And, and this one on the screen now is. Our main URL for our program. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to advance the screen here. There we go. So, um, so 
several years ago in the previous administration, the week three, four forecast period became a priority Office of Science and Technology, OSTP, uh, kind of elevated this. NOAA got its folks together across the line offices and had some discussions. And that ended up, in the end, uh, creating some funding from Congress for a five-year initiative uh, from beginning in fiscal year 2016 uh, and five years carried this out to 2020. The funding landed in the Weather Service uh, in the Office of Science and Technology Integration uh, and is managed as part of the, all of our modeling portfolios under Fred Tepfer. So we have, and, 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 in, and that's by design so we can uh, leverage and, and manage effectively all of our model program development resources and that kind of our flagship effort is the next generation global prediction system as Heather mentioned uh, in her introduction earlier. Uh, it includes other activities such as the Coastal Act and air quality, um, uh, Sea Star granting program and so on. So all of these programs are, are managed together and we're on, on this one in particular we're very closely coordinated with the MAP program that Heather described earlier uh, and it's and, and part of the evidence of that coordination is this uh, uh, co-hosted uh, webinar. Uh, so um, the the weeks three four program is focusing on four priority areas. We're looking at extending product capabilities in some of our centers, uh, EMC or I'm sorry, the Climate Prediction Center, the Weather Prediction Center. Uh, we're also focused on extending our modeling capabilities, so improving our ensemble forecast system, looking at coupled modeling and so on, uh, largely working with EMC on that. Um, the the reforecasting and reanalyses now uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at uh, the Physical Science Division at ESRO and OAR out here in Boulder are looking at reanalysis and reforecasts and the guess, but with the advent through NGGPS of our new dynamical core, the FE3, uh, finite volume on a cube sphere model, um, we're kind of hitting the accelerator on that. And then finally, we're, we're, we get sort of a broad spectrum approach and tap the, the best talent the nation has to offer through a grant program. And that's really where a lot of this coordination with the MAP program is happening. Together, we're funding, uh, I think it's 19 by my rough count uh, multi-year projects across the country on a variety of topics uh, summarized here. Uh, and again, that's that's leveraging funds from the Climate Program Office and the Science and Technology Integration and Weather Service. Uh, so with that, um, that's just a sample product, uh, some of the, the extending product capabilities. These are now pushing out beyond the 6 to 10 day that we've normally done out to 8 to 14 days at CPC. So uh, this is the current image. Um, looks like the central U.S. towards the southeast is going to be a little below normal over the next couple weeks. And as we've been experiencing, above average in precipitation. So we'll see if that verifies. Um, so anyways, the, the, the grant program is our segue in, into our next talk. Um, one of the projects we're funding is uh, Christina Stan from George Mason University. She's an associate professor there in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic and Earth Sciences. Uh, Christina did her BS at the University of Bucharest, uh, and her PhD is from my alma mater, Colorado State University. Um, and her interests uh, span the, the topics of our programs, um, you know, modeling the current and future climates uh, using representations, explicit representations of cloud products, and she's looking at predictability uh, and prediction of intraseasonal variability in the tropics and, and the interaction between the tropics and mid-latitudes. Uh, as was mentioned by Frederick um, earlier, uh, Christine is, Christine is the uh, co-chair of the uh, prediction project and teleconnection sub-project, uh, and she also is co-chairing one of our um, NDGPS SIP uh, working groups on infrastructure. Uh, her talk's going to be about um, subseasonal to seasonal variability in the northern hemisphere mid latitudes uh, and the influence on forecasts at weeks three, four. So, with that, I will hand it over to Christina. Uh, and, Christina, thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, uh, team, and uh, also thank you both organizers for uh, the opportunity to uh, spread out the word on our uh, exciting work on uh, um, sources of predictability for weeks um, three, four. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, um, Laura Siasto, Dan Harness, and Michelle Leroux from uh, CPC, uh, Eric Maluni from Colorado State University, and my colleagues from uh, GMU, V. Krishnamurti, and uh, David Strauss. And also, um, I would like to acknowledge the support for this work from both the NGGPS and uh, MAP programs. So, um, what are the known sources of uh, predictability for week 3 4? Um, this is something in addition to uh, what uh, Frederick have already uh, mentioned. And uh, a quick survey of what we know about these sources. Uh, shows that uh, in observations, uh, surface air temperature over North America in uh, winter tends to be anomalously warm uh, 10, uh, 20 days following the MJO uh, in phase um, three. Um, statistical models um, show us that um, the forecast range of North America temperature anomalies can be uh, extended beyond 10-20 uh, days, especially for strong uh, MJO cases. Um, a recent paper by uh, um, Del Sol and uh, others from uh, um, GMU show that the most predictable components of winter precipitation uh, and temperature over the conus are related to EMSO, and uh, other predictable components are uh, related to the MJO. Uh, so all of these uh, results suggest that teleconnections, which manifest as um, simultaneous variations in weather and climate over uh, remote locations, are emerging as a, a potential source of predictability beyond the limit of uh, deterministic uh, weather uh, predictability. So one of the questions we would like to address in our project is whether the teleconnection patterns offer any sources of uh, predictability for, uh, for these time scales. And uh, we already know that the Northern Hemisphere has a rich uh, content of uh, teleconnection patterns, which were uh, nicely summarized by this review paper published in, uh, in 2002. Um, and to orient you a little bit on these figures, here on the left we have um, United States. So um, on interannual timescales, the dominant uh, teleconnection patterns of the Northern Hemisphere are the North Atlantic Oscillation that was uh, mentioned in the previous talk, the polar U uh, Eurasian pattern, the uh, East Atlantic oscillations, um, the Scandinavian pattern, the East Atlantic West Russia pattern, the Pacific North America pattern, and um, tropical Northern Hemisphere pattern, West Pacific pattern, East Pacific pattern, and um, while most of these teleconnection patterns characterize the interannual interannual variability of the mid latitudes, some of them also show uh, variability on uh, shorter time scale. And um, this is the uh, variability that we would like to um, explore and see if we can uh, relate it to the um, predictability at weeks um, three, four. So um, to decompose the variability of the mid latitudes in uh, its components, we apply the data adaptive method uh, known as the multi-channel single spectral analysis or MSSA. 
which was designed to isolate the uh, subseasonal and uh, seasonal variability of the uh, mid latitudes. So we applied this method to the daily anomalies of uh, 500 geopotential uh, height. And um, the analysis uh, isolated uh, three distinct oscillations uh, with the uh, power spectra uh, shown here, and these oscillations uh, have uh, periods of 120 days, 45 days, and uh, 25 days. The, um, the three panels underneath shows the um, standard deviation uh, for each oscillation expressed as the percentage of uh, standard deviation uh, from the total uh, standard deviation of the, the daily anomalies. So um, if we look at um, all, um, all of, uh, combine all of um, these three uh, oscillations, explain about 30% of the um, daily um, um, variability um, of the mid-latitude. Uh, mid uh, also, if we look at the uh, the patterns of uh, of this variability, we already uh, have some uh, ideas about um, the relationship between these uh, oscillations and the uh, canonical patterns that uh, I show you in the, the previous slide. So, for the remainder of my talk, um, I will focus on uh, on this uh, oscillation with a period of 120 days. And um, here, um, on uh, this, uh, on the left, I'm showing the EOF pattern of the 120-day mode extracted by the uh, MSSA analysis. And if we compare this pattern with the pattern of the um, North Atlantic Oscillation that uh, I showed you in a couple of slides before, uh, we can see that there is a good resemblance between this 120-day oscillation pattern and the uh, canonical uh, North Atlantic uh, oscillation. So um, I will refer to this 120-day uh, oscillation as the uh, North Atlantic uh, uh, oscillation. Um, this uh, panel here shows the time series of the uh, associated uh, with this uh, um, uh, pattern, and I'm showing here only about um, five years from from this time series, so we will be able to see some of the uh, the details associated with the variability. And indeed, uh, we can see um, the prox um, 100 or uh, so uh, periodicity uh, in, uh, in in the oscillations, and also some uh, interannual variability that uh, we already know. Um, the uh, uh, North Atlantic Oscillation can be uh, characterized. So um, the, this uh, MSSA uh, methodology allowed us to uh, decompose the oscillations in uh, um, some phases, it's similar uh, like we are familiar with decomposing the Madden-Julian Oscillation in uh, eight, uh, eight, eight phases. So here I am showing uh, the half cycle of the 100-day uh, uh, oscillation or, uh, or the NAL. And um, in phase one, uh, we see that um, phase one is characterized by uh, below average uh, heights over uh, Iceland and above uh, average uh, heights uh, over the uh, western uh, Atlantic. And in uh, phase two, um, the negative height anomalies retreat uh, poleward, and the positive height anomaly expands uh, westward over the uh, eastern uh, United States. In phase three, um, the negative phase, uh, the negative uh, height anomaly splits uh, into two centers, and uh, the above height anomalies uh, reach uh, almost reach the uh, west coast of uh, United States. Um, in phase uh, four, the 
below average uh, height anomalies uh, near the Iceland are uh, replaced are becoming replaced by uh, uh, positive uh, uh, anomalies and the above average uh, height anomalies over North America are being replaced by uh, uh, negative uh, anomalies that propagate uh, eastward from the uh, uh, North uh, Pacific. Um, and uh, I'm not showing here, but this is um, it for the uh, the other four phases. We see the um, the reverse of uh, of this pattern. Um, so. We already know that the um, canonical NAO um, it has a relationship to the surface temperature over uh, uh, over United States. And uh, for example, uh, during the winters when the NAO uh, is in the positive phase, which um, is here, uh, we have above average temperatures uh, across the uh, eastern United States and uh, during the winters, when the NAO is in the uh, negative phase, um, below average temperatures occur across mu much of the uh, eastern uh, United States. And um, there are also some um, indications that um, in certain uh, um, certain um, um, patterns of uh, of the NAO have different impact on uh, on on the um, U.S. temperature. So, uh, for example, in this slide I take from the uh, Climate Office of uh, North Carolina, uh, we are looking at an uh, event that uh, happened in January 1963, and um, in that particular uh, winter, the NAO height anomalies uh, were located uh, farther eastward, uh, away from the North American continent. And as a result, the uh, above average temperature anomalies occur along the uh, eastern uh, United States coast, um, a region that normally experiences uh, below average temperatures uh, during a, a negative uh, NAO phase. Uh, another example is here in uh, January 1966 when the uh, negative height anomalies were located closer to the, uh, to the uh, North American continent and as a result the below average temperatures uh, were transported into the um, deep uh, south. So similarly, uh, with this result, we would like to um, see if we can find um, any relationship between the phases of the 120-day oscillation and the um, surface air temperature uh, over the North American uh, um, continent. And here we are looking at the um, phase one uh, of uh, the oscillations on the left and the uh, composites of the uh, surface um, air temperature anomalies um, corresponding to, to this phase. And uh, you can see that below average temperatures are uh, seen over the eastern and central United States and above average temperatures prevail over the uh, western uh, U.S. In the second uh, fa phase two, I'm sorry, of the, uh, the oscillation, we see above average temperatures over the uh, eastern and uh, southeastern United States and uh, below average temperatures um, for the uh, the other regions of uh, of the North American uh, continent. In phase three, um, ab um, above average temperatures are seen across 
um, the Central and uh, Eastern uh, United States. And uh, in phase um, uh, four, these uh, positive uh, uh, temperature anomalies intensify. Um, and uh, also expand uh, uh, eastward. So to um, all of these results suggest that uh, this 120-day uh, uh, oscillation can have an, uh, um, an impact on the uh, prediction skill of the um, surface air temperature over the North American continent. And uh, to test uh, this hypothesis, uh, we use the uh, statistical model that is currently used by uh, CPC as one of their tools for the uh, experimental uh, week three, four uh, outlook. And um, this model is a, a statistical, um, it's a multilinear regression model that uses as uh, predictors the uh, MJO uh, indices, RMMM1 and uh, RMMM2, the NINO 3.4 um, index for uh, uh, representing the uh, ENSO influence. Uh, we added the uh, daily NAO index that was uh, uh, extracted using the MSSA analysis. And um, the model also uses a daily index for a linear long-term um, uh, trend. And the model predicts the two meter uh, temperature and uh, precipitation. Um, this plot here shows the uh, high key um, um, score um, of, of this model. Uh, and uh, we are looking at the, uh, the purple line and uh, this here in this plot, the model is, is compared to the other statistical models used by CPC and uh, 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 to um, the din um, dynamical models um, used by um, sorry uh, by the uh, used at, um, at CPC for this uh, experimental uh, forecast. So as we can see, the statistical model has a good uh, a, a good scale comparable to uh, the dynamical models. And here in this plot, the uh, NAO index was not uh, uh, included in um, when when the um, the scale was uh, was calculated. So here in this slide, we are um, we are showing the impact of the um, 120 day uh, oscillation on the um, the forecast scale and the top panel shows the uh, height key, uh, index for um, um, La Nina conditions the um, central uh, column shows um, results for uh, neutral uh, and so uh, conditions and the right panel shows um, or uh, both col col columns correspond to uh, El Nino um, conditions. The uh, vertical axis uh, scales the uh, MJO phases, and the uh, uh, last one uh, corresponds to um, so-called uh, weak uh, MJO uh, activity when the uh, RMMM index is uh, less than one um, standard deviation, and the uh, horizontal axis um, corresponds to the central month for which the um, the forecast uh, it was made. Um, so. The high key score is a skill score relative to uh, a random forecast. So um, positive uh, values means a forecast skill better than a 50% uh, uh, random chance. So the, uh, these top panels show the, the high key score of the model uh, before we added the, uh, the NAO uh, index. The bottom panels show the uh, impact of the uh, the NAO index, 
and uh, the positive values are interpreted as uh, improvements, whereas the negative values uh, represent uh, a skill um, degradation. So there is a lot of information in every single square on, on these diagrams, and we are just at the uh, beginning of analyzing and uh, interpreting these results. So uh, just um, overall, we can um, say that the addition of the 120-day uh, uh, oscillation resulted in some uh, improvement in the forecast skills for the uh, boreal winter. For the um, cases when the MJO is over the maritime continent or uh, uh, over the Western Pacific. And um, also, um, a result that it is uh, encouraging is this um, improvement that we see um, during uh, neutral um, and so years. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, we, we also see some um, degradation, some skill degradation, and that um, tends to be especially during the boreal summer and for cases when uh, the MJO is, uh, is over the, um, the um, Indian Ocean. So with this, I will um, conclude that our uh, study so far shows that the mean latitude variability uh, is characterized by uh, propagating oscillations with periods of uh, 120, day, 120, 45, and 25 days. The 100-day oscillation, the pattern of the 120-day uh, oscillation resembles the uh, canonical uh, NAO pattern. Um, the life cycle of this uh, oscillation has an impact on the surface air temperature over the United States, and the uh, daily variability of the uh, NAO can enhance the uh, week 3, 4 forecast scale on the uh, 2 meter temperature over, uh, over the United, over United States. So I think um, this is the end of my, uh, my presentation. Sorry, Tim, I somehow muted you again. Oh, that's all right. Um, were you going to handle questions? Oh, we can, we can both do that. That's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I can do that. Uh, so, so far, I don't, I don't see any questions that have come in. Um, I have one. Okay. So, so, Christina, that was a very nice talk. Thank you. Um, and it's kind of exciting to see that predictability. I, I'm a little bit intrigued by uh, the periodicities you found in the 500 millibar anomaly um, spectra and, um, you know, the fact that you found these three uh, modes, the 120-day, the 45-day, the and the 25-day. And so you focused on the 120-day. I'm curious um, if, if you think there's any skill in the 45- and 25-day modes and if you have plans to look at them or you've done some analysis. Um, yes, we definitely have plans to look at the impact of uh, of these uh, uh, oscillations. We did have analyzed um, the oscillations themselves, and the uh, 45-day oscillations tend to resemble the PNA pattern. Um, and we already know that the PNA pattern also has some uh, influence on the um, uh, temperature over uh, United States. So yeah, the next step will be to uh, implement to add these uh, other oscillations to the statistical model and see uh, if it makes any impact or not. Thank you. Uh, so. I don't see any questions coming in. Um, so, Christina, thanks very much. Yeah.
Sure. Thank you. And uh, so I will pass control now over to our uh, last speaker. Uh, so uh, the, the last speaker today is Anjay Weisheimer. Um, uh, Anjay studied physics and meteorology at Humboldt University in Berlin, and he received a PhD from Potsdam University on low frequency climate variability and quasi eutrophic low order models of the atmosphere. She spent a year as a Marie Cur Marie Curry postdoctoral fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science. After a period at the Meteorological Institute of the Free University in Berlin, she returned to England and joined ECMWF in 2005. Since 2011, she has held a joint position as a senior research fellow at the physics department of Oxford University. Her research interests include the predictability of weather and climate, especially on the sub-seasonal and seasonal timescales, the representation of model uncertainties in weather and climate models, and the attribution of extreme weather and climate events. Andrea, you should be unmuted, so uh, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, I hope you can see my slides okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very well. Right. Um, so the title of this presentation of the talk here is Atmospheric Seasonal Forecast of the 20th Century with a special focus on multidecadal variability and predictive skill of the winter and AO. And this is work um, that we did recently together with my colleagues these are all from Oxford. Natalie Schaller, who's now moved on to Oslo, Chris O'Reilly, David McLeod, and Tim Palmer. So, based on skill estimates from Heincast uh, made over the last couple of decades, some recent studies uh, have suggested that considerable co success has been achieved in forecasting the winter climate anomalies over the Euro Atlantic area using current generation dynamical forecast models. And um, the UK media in April 2014 make a big story. Here is a, a, a picture from the Times, one of the major newspapers, uh, with, the, with the headline, forecast is crack formula to predict long range weather. And they go, go on saying, extreme winters will be predicted with greater reliability than before after the world's best long-term forecast model was developed by British scientists, the Met Office said. The breakthrough may have substantial impact on the economy, allowing power companies and wind farms to anticipate energy demands, while airports and councils can estimate how much grid and antifreeze is likely to be required. So these are quite bold statements, and they are uh, um, they, they have been made. They were made at the time because of the publication of a paper by our Met Office colleagues, Adam Scaife et al. and GRL. And you see a plot that, that you might have seen before here on the right that shows the anomaly correlation skill of the ensemble mean from the seasonal prediction system, Glossy 5, from the Met Office over the last 20 years, starting in 1993, over a 20-year period here. And the they show in, in black the observational anomalies and in orange the model, the, the sort of solid line, the, the ensemble mean from the model here. And they end up with a correlation of 0.62 and claim that this is unprecedented before. And then last year there was a paper in the same group where they found correlation skill in forecasting the NAO even two winters in advance. Um, the similar levels of skill here. So the question whether the, the North Atlantic oscillation or the in general the climate over the Euro Atlantic region um, can be predicted with any confidence is still quite a matter of debate and ongoing scientific discussion. The seasonal forecasts um, in that region of the world are particularly difficult because three classified as three main region, reasons. One being that the signal to noise ratio and the predictability of the exotropical atmosphere is in general really quite low. The other point is that Europe, or the Euro-Atlantic area, um, is quite far away from the tropical areas where we expect much of the sources of predictability really. So the teleconnections from the tropical forcings are less direct 
and perhaps more money fold than in other parts of the world, like for instance America. And then another point that is really important, I think, the sample size for seasonal forecasts and to make such statements and predictability estimates are intrinsically always small and they are mostly limited not so much by the by the model we can create as many samples as we want with the model but it's limited by the number of observations of the seasons and usually we talk of sample size of the order of 20 to 30 years 20 to 30 seasons so that means that the estimate of seasonal predictability skill and reliability always suffer from rather large uncertainties and we should never forget it and always keep in back of our mind if we if we look at exciting results like high skill levels, for instance. Um, coming back to the question of the signal to noise ratio, this shows you just as an example how big the signal really is in forecasting the winter NAO. And this is an example from the ECMWF model. I'm sure with the other models that are out there, the, the problem is similar. We see here in, in black reanalysis um, anomalies of the or values of an NAO index, and then in red data from ensemble mean simulations of the ECMWF system for the operational system, and uh, in in the solid red line you see the signal of the ensemble mean, what we normally call the signal, and you see how small it is compared to the observed anomalies in the reanalysis. And what's often been done in the plot from from the SCAFE door paper from 2014 that was done as well, these ensemble mean Anomalies are then rescaled to make the signal look bigger, but it's only like a visual effect. The signal is very small, it's, it's very much close to zero, basically. So, another claim of, of uh, what that I mentioned in the beginning was that, that people say the high levels of skill that, was, that were recently produced in these uh, seasonal forecasts were unprecedented in the sense that we haven't seen them before. And this is not quite true, I would say. So here's an example from a paper by Wolfgang Müller that was published um, more than 10 years ago now, based on results from the um, from the European multimodel project, uh, research project Demeter, where several models, state of the art at the time, were run with very similar settings and um, yeah, setups to simulate periods um, up to 1960, this was the beginning of the era 40 reanalysis period, so we had reanalysis data there. And then we see here a table of correlation skill for the NAO again in winter for different sub periods. On the top line is a white background, it's for the more recent period from 87 to 2001, and then on the bottom part it's for an earlier, or it's for the longer period, the whole era 40 period that includes more than 20 years, uh, around 20 years earlier, uh, yeah, before 87. And what you can notice from, from these simulations is that um, models that had quite high levels of skill, and this is the value on the left is for the multi-model, but you see several other models here as well, they tend to have higher skills in the last 20, 30 years, but we're not able to obtain similar levels of skill if we went back further in time. And here's another study, um, she at all a few years ago, where we looked at these Demeter simulations, they are in the, the bottom part of this table here, and from we also looked at the follow-on project multi-model cast from the ensemble simulation, and this is five European models from the time here, and you can see the skill, correlation skill for NAO here for different time periods, and again, what you notice is that the models that have tend to have relatively high skill levels for the more recent period here, 1980 to 2001, are not able to have similar levels of skill for an earlier period, beginning in the 1960s. So, which leads us to conclude that there might, there might be a problem and we need to understand why models um, seem to not be able to obtain similar levels of skill um, in these earlier periods um, of, of the reanalysis here. In order to study this question, we recently did, or recently, well, one, two years ago now, we run seasonal hindcast not over the typical hindcast periods of 20 to 30 years, but we run all of the 
110 years that were available from the new European reanalysis of the 20th century. So this is called ERA 20C. I mean, in America, you have something similar, but this is the first European project that started in 1900 and went all the way up to 2010, atmospheric reanalysis. The, atmos the reanalysis only uses surface observations, pressure observations, and marine wind observations, and like all the other products, just purely from the model. We use these reanalysis to initialize atmospheric seasonal hindcasts, atmospheric in the sense that we prescribe the SSTs and the CIs using the same SSTs as in the reanalysis, which is head eye SSTs, so it's an uncoupled simulation, but let the model then run over four months um, from from these initial conditions. The, we did several experiments, what I'm going to discuss here are four months forecast. I started on the 1st of November for each of the 110 years from 1900 to 2009, that goes into 2010, to cover the boreal winter season. And we deliberately run rather large ensemble of 51 perturbed members to be able to look at some of the extreme events because that was one of the motivations for these studies really, for these simulations. So we see here as an example of um, how, how these hind cars look like, um, the global mean two meter temperature anomalies in DJF over the period 1900 to 2009 from, from these ensembles. Um, the shades of blue are the ensembles and the shades of orange are the ERA 20C reanalysis. Well, we can see, um, I, sh I should explain, the, the blue dots are the median of the ensemble, and then the darker shades of blue are the interquartile ranges, and then the, the, the lighter blue is the full distribution. And the red line is the deterministic ERA 20C reanalysis, and the, the orange band around this is an uncertainty estimate that was obtained from an earlier version of this reanalysis where they run an ensemble of 10 members that was in the final product that, that was gives an indication of a little bit of the uncertainties related to the reanalysis um, <clears throat> yeah as can be seen the the 100 year hindcast ensemble captures the verification data rather well in particular the multi decadal fluctuations and the strong warming during the last decades are well reproduced, though the model somewhat underestimates the, globing, the, the global cooling period of the 1950s to the 19, 1980s. Um, I should say all the plots that follow, unless stated otherwise, they were a publication that, um, that appeared at the beginning of the year in the quarterly journal of the Royal Meteorological Society. And um, as I said, we mostly interested in the NAO for, for, for this study here. And we look here, we talked a lot about the correlation, anomaly correlation skill that people often use to estimate um, as a simple way the, the skill of the NAO forecast. So what we see here is the NAO correlation skill. It's computed over, over the whole period of the 110 years using a moving window. And the window width is 30 years, which is the standard length of, for instance, the ECMWF hindcast for the operational season forecast is 30 years. So the last point in this graph here that is plotted at the middle of this moving window in the mid-1990s covers the 30 years from 1980 to 2009. And it shows a correlation that is significantly above the 95% levels of the 0.46, I think, in that case. Um, and then we move our 30-year window by one year backward and um, compute the correlation and score over the 30-year window all the time again and end up with this curve here of the correlation skill um, throughout the this, this century, 20th century. I should say the overall skill, if we take all the data together, the 100 10 years of data is 0.31, which is highly significant given the length of the data. But we see if we if we look at the variation of the skill um, over time, that there are distinct periods where the skill 
is higher than in others. I mean, overall speaking, I should mention the zero line is here. So in all of the periods we're looking at, we seem to have an estimate that is larger than zero, although you see these arrow bars here, these are 90% confident intervals, they're rather large, and for, for certain periods, they overlap with zero correlation. So we see um, quite some, um, some variation in the forecast skill um, with marked variability on the multi-decadal time scales. The, as I said, the estimates are positive throughout the entire century, but there are coherent groups of multiple decades where our analysis suggests that the skill over the different 30-year periods exceeds the 95% level. And these are the periods in the most recent years that were dominated by positive NAO indices, those in winters. And then also in the more towards the beginning of the century, between the 1920s and 1950s, roughly. Um, the skill is lower, though still positive, in the periods centered between the early 1950s and the mid-1970s. So you might wonder how significant are these variations in forecast skills, though. Um, you see the results from a simple t-test here, and these seem to suggest um, that the skill seem to be weaker in the middle part of the century, but the statistical evidence for, this, for a significant difference between these periods is not overwhelmingly is not overwhelming. So the, 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 over, the, the error bars, as you can see, confidence intervals, they overlap somewhat. But um, yeah, and this is, this is one of the points I tried to make earlier, that due to sampling uncertainties, these confidence intervals are relatively large and, and um, is sort of an intrinsic problem of the predictability of these estimates for the extratropical atmosphere. However, in order to show that these decadal variations in skill are not just um, a statistical artifact, in the following I try to present some supportive evidence that these multi-decadal variations in skill, which come with these moderate levels of statistical significance, co-vary quite strongly with statistics of the general circulation itself. And the combination of the relatively marginally statistically significant time series of skill correlated with various diagnostics of the circulation will lead us and has led us in their paper to hypothesize that the that the existence of the that the, the these multi decadal fluctuations um in the sub in the seasonal forecast skill levels are really kind of genuine and not just a statistical artifact. Um, if we compare the correlation skill, so the top plot here is the same as in the previous slide. If we compare it, uh, the, the, the variation of the correlation skill now with the index of the NAO itself, we, we see that, as is very well known, we have these, see this quite strong positive increase in the NAO towards positive, yeah, positive NAO states in the 1970s and 80s, and we see a period of more pronounced um, negative NAO states in the middle of the century. Um, and we see that in general, the periods of significant forecast skill coincide with periods when the 30 year average NAO index, which is this orange line here, is positive. And at first glance, this might suggest that the model is struggling to predict circulation in seasons with negative NAO. So we see these periods here in the middle of the century with lower levels of skill, and they tend to happen at times when the NAO index was more negative. To test this, we recalculated the correlation um, coefficient separately for years, for the, only those winters that had a um, negative, and separately again for only those winters that had positive NAO. And we see here in the bottom plot here in red, the correlation skill computed very similar as before with this moving 30-year window, but only taking those years into account that, that are positive NAO for the red line and the ones negative in the blue line. So the, the arrow bars are a bit larger because sampling is different. And um, we see how that these sort of um, 
these skills vary over time here. The correlation from the early 1970s onwards seems to come primarily from the skillful prediction of positive NAO years, whereas in the, in the earlier period, the negative NAO years appear to contribute at least as much or if not more to the correlation skill. That means that we cannot therefore conclude that the model is unable to skillfully predict negative NAO winters in general. The picture is slightly more more, more interesting in a way. So, um, so far all the skill measures we discussed was the anomaly correlation, which is based on the ensemble mean and does not take into account the probabilistic nature of the forecast, of ensemble forecast. Here we look at the rock skill score, at the probabilistic skill score to, to, to see how well we're doing in a probabilistic sense. And um, uh, the rock, for those of you who might not know the rock skill score, it measures the ability of a probabilistic forecast to detect the occurrence of certain events. For example, a variable falling above or below a certain threshold and um, encompasses hit and false alarm rates through a range of thresholds. So the rock skill score is the rock um, is sort of a skill score with respect to reference forecasts, and we use climatology as reference forecast. It means rock skill score one indicates that the forecast system can perfectly discriminate events from non-events while a rock skill score of zero indicates that the system does not offer any improvement over simply using climatology, which is our reference forecast. Um, from our 110 years of NAO forecast, we can construct a climatology of the forecast index and compute the percentiles of, um, of, of the, of the um, distribution. And this is shown in the plot on the top left here in steps of Five percent. So we're going from five to one hundred here, and you see the NAO index here. So the the median fifty percent is roughly at zero for the NAO index, and we use these percentiles separately as thresholds for defining binary event. Um, as I mentioned before, the rock skills was based on the idea that you want to discriminate events, and the event is defined by these thresholds from the percentiles. So in the plot below here on the, on the left, bottom left, we see the rock skill score for, for the, the range of these percentile events. So we see the largest rock skill score achieved for the very low percentile events. For the, for the and if, we, if we check in the distribution, these these are the extremely negative NAO events. So these have the highest levels of rock skill score. And um, if we go throughout the distribution for the, the, the other percentiles here, we, one thing we notice is that the best estimate, which is the red curve here, always gives us positive rock skill score, so always gives us an advantage over climatology. But we also see some estimates of uncertainties from these bars here, and these little blue crosses are another way of estimating the, the, the significance of the rock skill score. Basically, wherever there is a blue cross, it is significantly different from zero, which the same message is conveyed by the, these um, arrow bars here. So we see that for basically all the percentiles above 50% or nearly 50%, that means all the, net, the positive NAO states, we have significantly positive rock skill score probabilistic forecast score for the NAO, and we have even more so for the extreme negative ones. But in between, for the weekly negative NAO events in the percentile range of 25 to roughly 40, um, 40 is percentile, we see that we can't distinguish our rock skill score from zero, and um, in that case, in, for these cases, we don't find any significant score here, yeah, it's still there. On the right hand side of this plot, we see just um, a simplification of the, the, the percentile distribution from the left for three thresholds. Red is the medium, which is the 50th percentile. Blue is the lower tercile, so lower the 
33rd percentile and the upper third side is 67th percent. And how these thresholds defined through the tercile events change over time if we apply same sort of moving window as previously, um, which is showing you a little bit like how did the distribution of the ensemble forecast evolves over time. And we use these tercile thresholds to look at the time evolution of the voxel score separately for the lower and the upper tercile. And we, we, from, from the plot below here, at the, at the, on the right bottom here, we see that in the most recent periods from the mid 1970 onwards, the model demonstrates quite good significant skill in forecasting the probabilities of upper tercile NAO events. And if you look closely, these error bars are really significantly different from, from zero here, which is consistent with the skill of the positive NAO ensemble mean forecast in this period that we looked at earlier. In the earlier periods of the century, up to around 1950, the model generally produces skillful probabilistic forecast for both the upper and the lower turfile. And the overall NAO skill in the earlier period does stems from a really from a skillfully predicting a spectrum of NAO events. It's not only positive ones or not only negative ones, it's quite a spectrum, which is um, also highlighted um, in the ensemble mean correlation skill in, in, in the previous figures that we looked at. During the period that is centered between the early 1950s and early 1970s, the model has no significant ensemble mean correlation, as we saw previously. But, however, the model does demonstrate significant skill for the lower tercile event during part of the middle of the 20th century, looking at this, this curves here. In this period, the lower tercile events correspond to winters with strongly negative NAO index. And we can see in the distribution here the negative, the, the lower tercile, which is the event we're looking at in the blue curve here, um, really goes up to NAO indices of minus one or so, which are in the category of the strongly negative um, NAO events. And as we saw in the overall rock scores here, these are the ones that we can um, most skillfully predict. It is sometimes useful to compare the dynamical forecast from our model, the benchmark statistical forecast, in order to gauge the value of using dynamical models that are based on physical principle, principles. So here in the top plot in the gray blue line, we use um, we construct a simple persistence forecast, which targets the same DGF season, winter season. Um, as a dynamical forecast and as a predictor, we use the monthly mean NAO index uh, of the reanalysis from the previous November. And we can see uh, we plot the skill in a very similar way as for the dynamical model here that the correlation skill of the persistence forecast is lower than the dynamical forecast skill and not significant for most of the century except for a period centered around 1960, in which the correlation reaches a peak. Um, it's perhaps interesting to note, I don't think I have much time to go into detail here, but it's interesting to note in the plot below here, again, the orange line is the NAO index, the filtered index, that this period where we see some skill from a persistence forecast, but not so much from the dynamical models, is a period where the intraseasonal variance is anomalously high. So this is the intraseasonal 10-day variance of Z500. Um, smoothed is the same sort of filter over that period. And you see that it looks like um, a distinct period here in the middle of the century where, where, this, where, this, um, where these anomalies, the, the, the variance, intraseasonal variance is especially higher. Um, these findings, I think, they, they are consistent with the hypothesis that um, that that upper level Rossby wave breaking events occur perhaps more frequently during periods of negative NAO than during periods of positive NAO. Um, I would like now. Oh, here's another example from this is from a paper from 
Fletcher and Saunders about 10 years ago. They only came across after we really published our things, or shortly before we finally published it. It's based on a statistical prediction system um, using temperatures, extratropical temperatures over different periods here. And they, they run the statistical prediction for the NAO again, also over the same, a similar period. It was quite impressive. I mean, it was interesting to see completely independent comparison. And what they find is, you see, this is for different seasons, using predictors for different seasons, um, that in general, they find a very similar behavior with a period of low skill towards the middle of the century and both ends, more recent periods and more earlier periods of, of the century, um, rather larger skill from the purely statistical prediction, which is in agreement with what we see um, qualitatively speaking in our dynamical forecast models. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the relationship with other indices of the general circulation because as I tried to mention, the, the, um, we see a sense that the, the variation in skill of the NAO co-varies with um, indices of the general circulation and one obvious region to look at is of course in the tropics, because the tropics provide a forcing, much of the forcing for the extratropical predictability on our timescales. And here is an example of a um, few SST indices. In blue, it's from the tropical Indian Ocean, filtered similarly as before, 30 years moving window. The red is East Pacific, tropical East Pacific, and the yellow color is tropical West Pacific. And all of these tropical oceanic basins seem to agree on having quite a cooling around, quite an abrupt cooling also around the middle of the century and then with a strong warming going from there and um, there's speculation about the impact of the Indian Oceans and whether the trend in the Indian Ocean um, uh, is related to the, the trend we, we had observed in the, especially from the 1980s onwards in the NAO index itself and this is sort of interesting hypothesis for further research in, in the seasonal forecast community as well here. Um, we also see evidence of similar sort of behavior if you look at the ENSO SST indices. For instance, here in blue is the Nino 3.4 index, which is the SSTs in the tropical, central, tropical Pacific. And we see roughly a period here in the middle of the century where we have these low levels of skill where they are normally really cold and then warmer in the more recent periods and before that, that cold spell here. And similarly, PDO seems to have some multi-decadal variability on these timescales that seem in broad agreement and um, provides an interesting hypothesis to, to explain this sort of dip in skill that we find in the NAO. Um, something that is really very much work in progress, we only, oh, I only at it earlier this week, is um, an experiment we performed with similar setup of this as the long hind cast where we relax the tropical atmosphere towards the reanalysis. Um, I noticed that my colleague Frederic Vitar talked about relaxation experiments in relation to the MJO um, earlier this morning. But what we do basically is we, we take a tropical band, and this is supposed to be 20 north, 20 south, and we nudge the atmosphere towards the reanalysis state. We're using prescribed SSTs anywhere, but anyway, but we, in addition to the prescribed sea surface conditions, we also sort of almost prescribe the atmosphere there. And if we run our long hindcast, seasonal hindcast experiment, by always nudging the tropical atmosphere to its best estimate from the reanalysis state, what can we what can we get out for the NAO predictability? And this is um, this is a plot that I'm yeah this is relatively new that shows in blue our control experiment the one I talked about so far with a drop in skill around here and then in red we see um, this tropical relaxation experiment over the same period and it's quite interesting if you only look at the last point here. So this is what we would normally do in seasonal forecasting. We have 30 years of hindcast and we can do relaxation experiments. And I looked at this before. And from these relaxation experiments, you might get the impression, oh, the tropical 
atmosphere um, plays some role, but not hugely for being able to correctly get forecasting the NEO in terms of correlation skill. There's only a marginal difference here. But then if we go back to the periods where we really suffered in our NEO correlation skill, we see quite a dramatically different behavior um, if we prescribed or if we relax the tropical atmosphere here. And this then changes again behavior in the earlier parts of the century where there might have been a different climate regime, multi-decadal sort of um, regime in the, in the overall climate system where the, the tropical forcings here, this plot might suggest that the tropical forcings don't play as much as a role during these decades here as they do for these later parts. This is all very much speculation at the time and at the moment in terms of understanding what's going on, but this will be something we, we're really interested in are going to look more in the future. And just to mention near the end now, um, work of my colleague Chris O'Reilly, and this paper was literally accepted yesterday, I think, in GRL. He tries to look at the link between the NAO and the PNA in these long hind cars. And for instance, here's an example of how the PNA and NAO co-vary on different timescales. So very long multi-decadal timescales, they have a very similar behavior with the um, sort of lower values in the middle of the century and we, with quite a strong upward trend here. But on the shorter timescales, a few years' times, they're quite anti-correlated. The interesting thing is, if we then look at the skill, the correlation skill, in a very similar way as we did for the NAO, we see very similar behavior just amplified in a way. Um, in the PNA as well, which is the red curve here. So we see almost at the same time synchronized almost uh, a drop in skill to basically zero here from very high levels before and after. I mean, these are highly significant here. I didn't put error bars, but they're much more significant than the NAO skill, which are intrinsically, is intrinsically lower. And we're trying to understand um, the relationship between the, the behavior of the tropical forcings and the predictability then both for the NAO and the, the PNA here. Which then really brings me um, to to my end, to the end of the presentation. Um, I hope I could show you that um, that the new global data set of sea atmospheric hind cars um, that covers the, the winter season, but we have other seasons as well, um, as a useful uh, source of for predictability studies, especially with the aspect of multi-decadal variations in predictability. Um, we found positive and significant skill in predicting the NAO index for the winter seasons over the entire period, but we also saw quite distinct multi-decadal variability of the forecast skill. So there's, in general, no um, no evidence that the model cannot predict negative NAO winters, but there's quite some asymmetry in the predictive skill um, depending on the phases of the NAO. So the extreme negative ones were the phases of the NAO that we could predict with the highest levels of skill. The weakly negative ones were the ones that were most problematic and didn't show any significant skill. And all the negative um, percentiles of the definition of the NA, positive NAO phases, again, were quite well had high levels of predictive skill. We, we, um, we, we can't at this stage really answer the question whether any flow-dependent nonlinear model errors or perhaps lower intrinsic predictability of the atmosphere are the main causes for the lack of skill in the mid-century. But one thing we, I think, can conclude is that the mid-century period stands out as an important period on which to test the performance of any future seasonal forecasting systems because achieving good forecast skill for recent decades which predominantly had positive NAO uh, winters is not really sufficient to guarantee any similar good performance for possible periods um, with more negative NAO winters in the future. We saw briefly at the end that there's quite some remarkable co-variability of the NAO forecast skill with the PNA behavior and the question of um, the role of the remote tropical drivers on the extratropical predictability is an active area of research we are currently looking at. Thank you very much. Andre, thanks so much. That was fantastic. Um, 
So uh, I just want to see if there are any really quick questions. We're over our time, unfortunately, but um, I do want to. Oh, so it looks like there's one from Rich uh, Woodford and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> other people too, but um, unfortunately, yeah, we have to give up our room. So, uh, Rich, go ahead. Hello? Hi, yes. Do you have a quick question? Um, and it goes, it's a very simple question, it's a couple of the slides. Around 1975, on the skill assessment and some of the ENSO variation, there was almost a vertical uh, jump. Is that caused by the introduction of extra data sets like satellite data or the TOGA core buoys? If you go back a couple of slides, I think you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, yes, the answer is no, because in that reanalysis that we used to initialize the data, um, only surface observations of pressure and um, marine winds were used in the assimilation. There were no satellite data used in the assimilation there, so the, the initial state didn't know anything about the satellite. And so the, the, this analysis, the reanalysis, really is not one of the it's not comparable in a sense with like the most um the most up to date era or new era five analysis where the aim is to assimilate as many data as possible. This was done really to have a long um a long reanalysis with the aim for basically for climate studies in a sense where the level of data assimilated were almost kept constant. So I don't think we can we can attribute this this jump in skill. I guess this is what you mean here, to to any of the data used. So the there were yeah, some different yeah. slides in your explanation, and, and uh, uh, I'll pass on that. Uh, which one? Uh, they were closer to the end, I believe. Um, this one? Uh, that's one, and then there was that was 55, but they were both around 1975. Uh, keep going. Oh, are we near the end now? Um, I can't yeah. remember that. I won't take up any more time, but it was it just jumped out that there was a pretty much a vertical leap uh, around 1975 on a couple of the indices. Here yeah, you can see it. Here, um, here's quite a jump as well. Um, I should say that there's quite some uncertainty around this estimation of the correlation Skill. So the correlation for each of these data points is based on 30 data points on say 30 years, and by moving one year ahead, you have quite a big jump here. But the, it's, it's sampling. Large part of this can be sampling uncertainty, which is indicated by these um, uncertainty bars, by the error bars that I showed in the beginning. So I can't I can't give any attribution statement really where this comes from. Um, other than saying that we're looking to these tropical um, forcings, they, they do seem to have a more a sort of a smoother, steadier behavior rather than these big jumps. But okay. it could be Thank some you. Not. I appreciate that. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Anja, you have quite a few more questions coming in, but unfortunately we, we do need to um, wrap up now. Uh, is it okay for um, people to contact you? Uh, through email? Of course. Yes, okay. Yeah. Is your email uh, easily found online? Um, yeah, it's probably easiest through Oxford. It's my name and Oxford Physics. If you if you Google it, you'll probably find it. Yes. I'm okay, perfect. Find. Great. Okay, thank you so much, Sanjay, and uh, the rest of our speakers for, for really uh, excellent talks across the board and great discussion. And uh, stay thank tuned you. for our, our next uh, webinar announcement, um, or our next webinar, which will probably be uh, in the next couple of weeks. Thanks again.